Good morning and Shabbat Shalom and welcome. I'm Rabbi Ed Feinstein. This is Valley Beth Shalom, Torah study for a Shabbos morning. And it's my privilege once again to be back with my dear friends, Rabbi Sherry Hirsch of the American Jewish University and Rabbi Mark Gilman of uh, South Florida and, uh, and of New York. It's great to be with both of you and Shabbat Shalom to both of you. Um, this week... This week, extraordinary Torah portion. I, I guess I say that about every Torah portion, but this one is interesting because of the contrast with what we had before. We're still in the Abraham stories. This is the last of the series about Abraham and his life. Last week was the denouement. Last week was the climax. Last week, we had two incredible, phenomenal, monumental moments. The angels come and announce that Sarah is going to give birth to Isaac. And then Abraham is told that Sodom and Gomorrah are going to be destroyed. Abraham argues with God in order to preserve the justice of the world. As Sodom and Gomorrah are destroyed, his nephew Lot is saved. Remarkable set of events. And if that weren't enough, at the end of the Parsha, we have Akedat Yitzchak, the sacrifice or the near sacrifice of Isaac. Here we have two remarkable events which, which describe as we argued last week, they describe the relationship between human beings and God, what it means to live in the world with a living, active God, and what are the models that the Jewish tradition, what are the models that the Torah presents to us about what it means to live with God? Does one argue? Does one obey? Where, what is the character of the religious person who lives with God? Turn the page to this week's Torah portion, to Chaye Sarah. And something startling happens. Nothing. That is to say, nothing monumental. Nothing phenomenal. Only two simple events. In the beginning of the portion, from the very first word, Sarah passes away. Sarah dies. Abraham grieves, mourns for her, and arranges the purchase of a burial place, the cave at Machpelah, which today is in the city of Hebron, and buries his wife. And the second story is having buried his wife, he realizes it's time for Isaac to get married. So he sends the servant back to the old country to locate a wife for his son. And at the very end of the Parsha, Rebecca, Rivka, will <clears throat> come to Canaan and move into the tent of Sarah and become Isaac's wife. Two prosaic, simple, common, mundane events. A man loses his wife and grieves for her. And then a son gets married and begins his family life together. And the contrast between the two parshiot, between last week and this week, is so pronounced. Last week, Sodom and Gomorrah and the Akedah. This week, grief and matrimony and marriage. And yet, and yet, it's in those very experiences that most of us meet God. Or that is to say, if one were to make a chart of the religious movements of life, I think almost everybody would put down moments of profound grief when we lose loved ones, standing before the open grave, standing together with friends and family, trying to figure out what life is now that death has become so real to us. And the marriage of a child or, or one's own marriage, bonding with another, beginning a family, beginning a life together, that's, after all, where most of us meet God, where most of us are not Abraham fighting for Sodom and Gomorrah. Most of us are living day to day, and it's in these moments that we actually come to meet God. So let's take a look and ask that question. How is it that in these kinds of moments, meaning can be found, strength can be found, and, and if we dare say it, God can be found? Grieving. Sherry, you've been a rabbi for a long time, and I know you've been with many, many families who have suffered grief. What has grief taught you? So I just want to first say that today's my father's York site. Oh. Um, so may his memory be for a blessing and may this Amen. Torah be in his memory as well. Um, so grief is really on my mind today, more than even normally. But in being a rabbi for 25 years, I think grief has taught me that while we all have common experiences, there's one thing that we universally experience, which is grief, right? Some of us get married, some have children, some 
get a job, some don't work. Everybody has all these plethora of common experiences. But the one thing we all experience is grief. And what I also have learned is we're all ill equipped to handle it. Like none of us got the manual and we've learned how to drive. We've learned how to go to college. We've learned how to get married. We, we have all these different things that set us up for at least a toolkit. But grief is the one thing that we truly don't have the toolkit for until we're in it. And none of us are prepared. The amount of times that people said to me, I knew this person was going to die and yet it hit me like a ton of bricks. Or I knew that this was imminent and I can't believe how devastated I feel. And it's not just the death of a loved one. It's all these deaths that we experience in life, whether it's the death of dreams or the death of a job or the death of a, a fantasy, whatever it is, where none of us are prepared for them. And that's been the universal lesson for me. And by the way, I include myself 1000% because both my parents died once when I was, one parent died when I was 30, my father, and one passed away when I was 40. And they were both in, one was 58 and one was in this, her early 60s and completely unprepared. And that's after being a rabbi, counseling, studying, learning. I mean, I had done the due diligence. I had done the homework and yet completely unprepared. So let me ask you to put back your rabbi hat for just a moment and, and help us understand what do I reach for? What tools are, are at my, my disposal? Where do I get the strength to deal with a, a loss, to deal with the death, the end of something, so that I can move forward in life and without a sense of bitterness and anger and despair? So I use the language of faith because I'm a rabbi and that's a language that speaks to me. But the definition of what that means is not faith in God or faith in that it will be okay. It's the belief that I will have the desire to wake up in the morning and feel that my life has purpose and meaning. That's the faith. And for some people that gets expressed in the language of God, for some people get, that gets expressed in the language of community, it's all different, but faith is actually what I think drives us. And what I think grief does is it decimates our faith and forces us to rebuild a much more authentic one based on our life and circumstance. It's a, it's a wonderful way to think about it. I mean, the, uh, the sociologist Peter Berger talks about religion as a world construction and world maintenance function. It, it gives us a world we can live in, a world that's meaningful, that's relatively predictable, and therefore we can control some of the circumstances so we can move through the day, move through time, move through our lives with a sense of confidence that we know where we're going. And death is the ultimate challenge to that, shakes everything up. So Mark, you, you've done this for a very long time as well. Um, a, a, a family, an individual calls you and says, Rabbi, uh, my loved one has passed away and I don't know what to do. And, and they're not looking for a cemetery plot. They, they've taken care of all that. What they mean by I don't know what to do, of course, is I, I don't know how to greet the new day. I don't know how to move forward in my life. What, what do you offer them? Well, <clears throat> I went through two stages in this. When I was young and impulsive and stupid, as opposed to old and wise, and in many ways still stupid, <clears throat> I would try to provide them with some theological architecture. There's this and that and God and this. And, and I would expl try to explain away their grief. And at, at a certain point in my rabbinate and in my life, I realized this is not helping them. This is not wise. This isn't true to grief. And that ushered in the second stage of my life in which I basically try and teach them a single prayer that I made up. It's, dear God, thank you for the pain. And they look at me and they say, what kind of prayer is that? I said, well, let's talk about this. I said, you're in pain, right? Yes, terrible pain. I said, well, what would you do if I offered you an opportunity to get rid of all the pain, 
But the price of it, before you answer, is that you never would have loved the person the way you did. You would never have loved them as deeply as you did. You would never have loved them as selflessly as you did. But when they died, you wouldn't feel the pain you feel now. Would you take that deal? And of course, not one person said that they would take that deal. I said, so, okay, let's just think about this. You're saying you willingly accept the pain you have now because you know that it's a measure of the love you had for the person who died. And they said, yes, that's exactly right. I said, well, then what you have to do is thank God that you were made in such a way that you were capable of giving and receiving love. And that giving and receiving of love, when it's taken away, causes suffering. There's an entire religion built on that truth, and it's called Buddhism. Their first of their fourfold noble truths is called dukkha, which means suffering. And the second is the cause of it, suffering, which is tancha. It means attachment to the world. And then there's a way out of the suffering, which is not our way. So that's what I try and teach them, that pain is the measure of love and that they should give thanks for pain because it's proof that they truly love the person who died. You know, Sherry, what's one of the interesting things about this Torah portion, and I think Mark points to it, is um, in the previous Torah portion, God is all over the place. God shows up at the beginning with angels. God is chatting with Sarah about the birth of Isaac. God is arguing with Abraham about Sodom and Gomorrah. God is talking to him, telling him to kill his kid. And then suddenly, it's like God disappears. There's pain. Mark is exactly right. Abraham cries. First time Abraham cries. First time, Ab and it's, it's, it's an astonishing statement that he cries because, you know, this is a man who was ripped out of his own home. He didn't cry. He comes to Canaan, has to go to Egypt, has his wife gets kidnapped. He doesn't cry. He has to rescue her. He doesn't cry. Even at the Akeda, he doesn't cry. His, his son is lying on an altar with a knife at his throat, and Abraham doesn't cry. Sarah dies, and he cries. Mark, Mark's pointing out you know, the, 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 the quantity of love, the quality of love, and the quality of grief are attached to each other. But there, the other question is, so where is God in this Torah portion, and where is God in Abraham's tears? Well, if I might say, there, there is God. There's an angel. Don't forget the angel. God says... I'll send an angel ahead of you and he'll, and we'll find a wife for Isaac. So there's, there's an, so God is in this story through angels. We'll come back to that one in a minute. That's all about J day. Well, let's first, I want to finish grief. first. We'll but we're first. assuming that he's solely crying for the end of Sarah's life, but actually I think he's crying for the culmination of all those losses. Uh that's what actually broke him where he could actually reassess what does it mean to be faith, to have faith, right? I think it's not that it was Sarah that made him cry. It was that there was this ongoing, the leaving of his father. Well, that didn't break him, but it contributed to the grief. And then you get to this pinnacle moment where he sacrifices his son and you would think that it broke him, but had he broke there, maybe he couldn't have, maybe he couldn't have walked down the mountain, right? Maybe he couldn't have. So it's actually the culmination is that the finality of this chapter of his life is the story, this narrative that made him who he is, is completely over, is what actually fundamentally breaks him. And the tears are the, not him breaking apart, but him breaking open, right? There's a difference between the tears tearing us apart and decimating us so that we're annihilated. And then there's the tears that break us open so that we can actually emerge with something new. That's a beautiful thought. That's a profoundly beautiful thought. So let's turn then from the sadness at the beginning of the Torah portion 
to this remarkable experience at the end. This is what Mark just represented a moment ago. Abraham says, my son is getting old. He's 40 something. It's time for him to get married. And the first question is, why doesn't Isaac go find a wife? Um, but Isaac is kind of passive in general. Abraham is gonna find him a wife. And there's a servant who the Midrash will later associate with Eliezer, although he's not named in the story, who carries the message to go and find the wife for the master's son. And he goes to the old country and he ends up by happenstance at the well and he meets Rebecca and the story, and she comes back with him. And then of course, at the end of the story, there's this tiny little quirk. She sees him in the distance meditating out of the field. She asks the servant, who's that? He says, that's my master. And she literally fell, falls off the camel. It's the first documented case of a woman falling in love. And uh, she picks herself up and brushes herself off, gets back on the camel, and they live happily ever after. Well, not exactly, but the question here is love and the power of love to heal grief and the power of love to open up a heart and to fulfill a human life and the power of, and the importance of marriage is part of that, that process. So we should get to this question of the angel, but I wanna wait just a moment. I wanna ask a different question. Mark, again, you've been doing this for a very long time. You've sat with countless couples getting married. Um, what do you look for when you first sit down with a couple? that tells you that this is a couple that uh, is, is, is ready to be married or, 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 or is ready to start thinking about being ready to be married? And what do we teach them to, in order to be married? Yeah, I, I've gotten much more simple as I've gotten older and I look for fewer things, but more important things. When I, when I do funerals, I, I only look for one thing. Did the person have wrinkles? And I build a whole thing about whether they had wrinkles. That's all I need to know about it. I need to see it in their face. If they have wrinkles that they were smiling their whole life. I think I, it would be very hard to do funerals in Los well, Angeles. That's, that screwed up my whole funeral practice. <laughs> yes, I agree. However, in general. You opened it up. I had, to, I had to take the ball. Aside from Botox. Botox if funerals. Speak for the, but for weddings, I only look for two simple things. The couple sitting in front of me, I'm looking for two things. Do they touch for no reason? And do they laugh? Because physical intimacy is not just sexual relations. People know until you have had physical intimacy with another person, you just, you don't get it. But once you've had it, you see it's, it's not solely or even primarily a sexual thing. It's, I need to touch your hand right now. I just, I need to touch your cheek. I need to give you just a, a little kiss. I, I just need to, to touch you. I need that sense that I want you to feel that I'm connected to you physically. It's why when rabbis refuse to put their hands on people's heads for the bracha, I said, you're missing something. And Tommy taught me that. I would just give him a blessing. He said, why don't you ever put your hands on their head? I said, I, I, I'm not a touchy-feely guy. He said, no, no, you need to touch. And, and so the, do they touch? The second is, do they laugh? Life is just, for those of you who don't, haven't gotten the memo, life is just not always <laughs> so sweet. It's not always a bowl of cherries. And if you're going to survive this, you have got to have a sense of humor. If you don't, you are doomed. And for me, I, I would always wait and see, does, can he make her laugh? Can she make him laugh? And I can tell from someone's laugh, just like I can tell from their wrinkles, I can tell if they have lived an authentic life. Uh, it, there's a there's an authentic laugh, and then there's a a fake laugh like ha, ha, ha. it's it's so immediately clear. So those are the two things I look for: do they do they touch, and 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 do they laugh? I ask them other things, but I'm not really listening. I'm just looking for those two. 
Sherry, what do, what do you look for in a couple and what do you teach them? Well, before I answer that question, I think there's something really beautiful about that Abraham's grief is healed by his son, by his children finding love, right? It's not that he finds love again, which may be something that would have healed him, but he sees love existing and continuing in the world and within his lineage. And I think about that a lot, right? That when we feel broken open, what sustains us is often when we see other people mended together or falling in love, right? That actually is a seed to help us weave ourselves back together. Just a sidebar. Um, so I go through a rigorous process with my couples to make sure that they're on the same page because I just don't want a litany of divorces in my resume. It's very self-serving, right? I just am like nervous about that, that like I'm the rabbi who's married 50 couples and 49 have been divorced. So I put them through a very rigorous counseling, not that I can guarantee that they won't divorce, but I can at least give them vehicles and tools to help them identify and see what questions they have and what are those trouble spots in their marriage and tools of which to address them as they go forward. And I would also say that once you get married by me, you can't get rid of me. I have a couple, they do a spiritual check-in every year and sometimes more than, more than once a year. And I have couples that just came in for their 25th check-in and literally I'm like, they get a note from me with a reminder. So it's pretty hardcore, but, um, what I'm always looking for, and I think Mark sees it in the tactile and in the laughing, I see it, is there that unspoken, not chemistry, but I would call it empathy or compassion towards the other person. When there's something hard, is there an ability to see the other person and the way that they see each other? And I can't really describe it because it doesn't always come in the form of laughing or touching. It comes in the way that they look at one another. And I can identify it when I see it, but when I don't see it, I know when it's not there. And sometimes it takes more than one session for me to see it because I never know where they've come from. Like they might've just come from an argument with their parents. They might've just come from a financial discussion. They might've just left work. So it, I always sort of don't know what the pretense is and the after, but I always say to them, at some point in the counseling process, I want to see that untangible, intangible um, connection that says, I deeply see you and I empathize with you and I am with you. Um, I, I guess, you know, there's some things you only know when you see it. Not Mark, very helpful that, for young rabbis because no, it's like, no, no. I want to, I want to, uh, this is fine. This is fine. Mark, is there something that you'd talk to couples about to help, to help them begin their married life together? I mean, we, we talk about how to do a wedding, but, but I also have the sense that even though we're not therapists, it's really our responsibility to help teach them something about marriage. Um, I always feel that responsibility very greatly. Something that you speak about with couples? No. I have a very different view of my contract with people who come to me to get married. Um, it may be controversial, maybe not, but it's the way I work. And it's basically this. I say, look, we're talking about a 20 minute ceremony here. You didn't come to me. I think let's be honest about this. You didn't come to me to be your lifelong therapist or spiritual guide or even your lifelong rabbi. I'd love to be your lifelong rabbi. But marrying you isn't the contract that's going to do that. In order for that to happen, you have to join my community, connect with me in ways that are meaningful. But let's just be honest here. <laughs> you need someone to marry you. You're both Jewish. I'm happy to marry you. I'm going to tell you about the ceremony. And let's do this. And what I found is that those who wanted to develop a deeper relationship with me over time did so, but, you know, I didn't feel it was my responsibility to teach them how good marriages work. 
First of all, I don't know how good marriages work. If you're honest about the people you've counseled, you would have to admit, because I admit this in full honesty, there have been couples I was sure would have a two month marriage and they've been married for 30 years now. And there are couples who I thought would be married for 60 years and they had the two month marriage. So I can't predict, and I don't think you can predict. I don't think anyone can predict what the, the, the structure of a, of a good marriage is. Um, you know, there's general things about selflessness. When I talk to them about intermarriage, my first question is, are you patriotic? And they look at me like I'm nuts. And I say, yeah, I'm asking you, do you believe that you owe a debt to America for the freedoms you enjoy now? And when they say, no, I don't think we do. We owe a debt to our careers and to our personal lives and to each other. I said, well, then this conversation's over because what I'm about to tell you is that you owe a debt to Judaism to keep it going and the Jewish people to keep it going. But if you don't think you have a debt to America, you certainly don't feel you have a debt to Judaism. So, you know, I don't always say those words, but that's what I am aware of. The point is that great marriages happen when people are capable of selfless love. When people are only capable of selfish love, of love that, that feeds their own egos and their own needs, the marriage can last because sometimes people stay married because of a lifestyle or money or other trivial reasons. But all, all, the only great marriages I know are marriages which endure because they really are selfless. They love the other person more than they love themselves. They love the other person's joy more than they love their own joy. And that is a given as the result of love. It's not the result of some class I teach them. And my contract with them is very limited. I will marry you. And, I, and if you want me to be your rabbi after that, I'm happy to do it. But let's just get this straight. This isn't a lifetime commitment you've entered into. Okay. I, I think you, you mentioned two things which I think are critical for understanding this Torah portion. Um, one is selflessness and one is love. And because both of the episodes of this Torah portion have to do with selflessness and with, with self yep. and the boundaries of self and, of course, with love. In the first instance, we're dealing with grief. We grieve that which we love. We grieve for the people that we love. We grieve for the people who are part of us, who have been part of our being in the world and our celebrating life in the world. And, and, there, and the, the great paradox of being human, as the great Ernest Becker taught us, is that you know, the, the, the personality, the soul, the self, the being of a person is immortal and infinite, but the body is finite. And while bodies die, the soul, the person that we love is still with us in some powerful ways, and yet we can't hold them, we miss them. And that's what goes on at the gravesite. And it's really, it's a lesson in the boundaries of self and what makes up self and the sense of our blending of selves to stand with a family at graveside and to cry together over someone who has been so important to us, so, so supportive, so loving, so giving, so, so wise in teaching us. And, and that's part of what it is. And I think Mark was exactly right, that we grieve because we love, and it's an expression in some ways of love. And it's only that love that gets us past it. It's only the recognition that, that what was so precious to me is still part of me that I can move into the rest of the the rest of my life without this person being here physically because they're very much still very part of me uh, in in the in the process of my life. And the other episode is is marriage, which is this profoundly courageous moment of saying myself is incomplete without you. Myself, I can't live another day without you, and I need to have you here. And I pledge to you that I will care for you, that's what the ketubah is, that I'll share with you, that's what the ring is, that I'll create a world, a home with you and a world, that's what the chuppah is, 
and that this is this is this remarkably courageous statement that the boundaries of myself are open now to you and your pain will be mine and your laughter will be mine. I, that's what makes it so wonderful. And because it's such a courageous act and it's such a fate, an act of faith. I mean, as the great rabbi uh, uh, Paul McCartney once wrote, you know, it's easy to love you now because you're cute, but will you still need me? And will you still feed me when I'm 64? Well, I'm 67 and she still, still needs me and feeds me um, some days. So, so the, and but we love each other, and to, you know, because we've shared life together, and and that's why I think one of the reasons why we cry at weddings, just like we cry at funerals, we cry at funerals because there's a recognition that we have blended ourselves, and we cry at, at, at weddings because there's a recognition of the faith and courage of the couple who stands before one another and makes that declaration in front of us all, and that's what makes weddings so remarkable. So let me finish with this. We have two wonderful rabbis here. Um, sweetest wedding you ever did, you ever led, you ever performed. Sweetest, most interesting, most elevating, most inspiring wedding you ever performed. Sherry has a smile on her face, so let's start with her. So they're all my favorites, right? Every child is my favorite and every wedding is the sweetest. But hands down, there's one that stands out different from all the others which is when I was a pulpit rabbi at Sinai there, I buried a man's wife and he sat on the far left of the shul when I was facing the kahal, the audience. And then there was a woman who I buried her husband about three weeks after I buried the man's wife. And she sat on the far right of the shul, but they had never met ever. And about Nine months after both of their respective losses, I actually was carrying the Torah in the procession and I grabbed her and pulled her to the other side of Sinai. And I said, sit next to this man because I knew they were both alone and I knew they were grieving and grieving needed company. And they sat next to each other. About a year later, I married them in Cohen Chapel but what I didn't know, they were both in their 80s, okay? So it was, and all the great grandchildren served as the flower girls and the groomsmen. But what I didn't know was that the bride never had an official wedding when she got married the first time because it was depression and they didn't have the money. And so they went to the courthouse and then later they had a rabbi officiate. So she wore a full on wedding gown and he wore a full on tux, like it was, they were two 18 year olds getting married and they walked down the aisle, the grandchildren, the great grandchildren, the family, there's probably 50 people at the wedding. And I looked at them and they were in their eighties, mind you. And they both looked like they were 18. And it was one of the most spiritual experiences I'd ever had. Like I literally saw two 18 year olds in front of me, like almost to the point that I thought, well, they're really young to get married. And I just remember that feeling being like, this is otherworldly. Um, and they had a wonderful marriage and they're both deceased now, but it was uh, pretty powerful. Beautiful story. Thank you. Mark, sweetest, most inspiring wedding you ever did. Oh, that was a beautiful story, Sherry. And I have one that's similar to it. I, I had a, a Torah class every Tuesday morning it was larger than yours, Eddie, but who's counting? And uh, every Tuesday morning, people would come and they would study with me. And it was, we would, we would do, it took 15 years to read the Chumash. And, and then we read it again for another 15 years. That's 30 years to read it twice. And through that time, I had people come in and out of the class but there were two regulars, a woman and a man on the other side of the room. And his wife died and her husband died. And they both got married from meeting in my Torah class. And to this day, that bond between them and Torah and me is, is unbreakable. And it was all because 
the thing they loved before they loved each other was Torah. They loved something beyond themselves before they loved each other. And, and that was, that was beautiful. And, and I, every time I see them, I, I think if I, I, I have no idea if I ever communicated any real wisdom in the Torah class. I hope I did, but I wasn't sure. But one thing I am completely sure about is that the Torah class that I taught had value because Marvin and Judy met there. That's beautiful. That's just wonderful. So I, I suppose I, I should say that my kids' weddings were the most inspiring, and they were, certainly were. Um, but I'll tell you a story. It's a story that I told before, so I apologize for repeating myself. But it really is, it made an impression on me, which I'll never let go of. I had a couple who came to me for a marriage, for a wedding. And they were, you know, they weren't really, they weren't 18 year olds. They, they were up, up a couple more years in life. Still young, of course, but, but, but they, they'd been through a lot of relationships and finally found each other and were madly in love. And we had a wedding booked and I didn't hear from them from a long time. So I called the groom, I had his number, called the home. And I spoke to him. I said, what's going on? Do we have a wedding? What's going on? He said, well, I have to tell you something. He said, my wife, my fiance, um, she had some terrible back problems. So we went to the doctor and after a lot of diagnostics, they discovered that she had a ferociously aggressive cancer. And that was the source of the back problems. And he said, Rabbi, I just don't think we can have a wedding. She's taking very strong chemotherapy. It just doesn't look good. It's a very ferocious cancer. And I can't see how we're going to have a wedding. And I said, gosh, I'm so sorry. I mean, that's a horrifying thing. Let me help you. We talked for a long time. I talked to her for a few minutes. She really was very, very, very weak. And I said to both of them, look, if there's anything I can do for you, you please, you're going to let me know. And they appreciated that. I get a call back from him the very next day. And he said, you know, after you hung up the phone, we had a little dinner. And she said, I still want to get married. That's what I want most of all. And, and, and he said, I don't think you can do this, but that's what she, I said, of course I can do this. We're going to do this. You pick a day, I will be there. So we picked an afternoon, a weekday afternoon, and it was a very warm day in the spring. And we did the wedding in their condominium. They had a wonderful you know, townhouse and they invited a bunch of their friends. So I get to this condo. And the place is packed with all of their friends. There may have been three or four Jewish people. All the rest were coworkers and neighbors and friends and everyone knew the story. And we had all come on time and we were standing waiting and waiting and waiting. And she had just had a ferociously difficult round of treatment and was very weak. And the, uh, she had a nurse who was taking care of us, a hospice nurse actually. And the nurse comes in and says, give me a few minutes. I'll take care of this for you. The nurse goes upstairs. And sure enough, a few minutes, moments later, the nurse calls down to us and says, okay, she's ready. So we gather around. I have a talus. I have four large men hold up the talus. You know, uh, we, have, uh, uh, we have the wine and we have the, all the stuff for the wedding. And he comes down with his brother and she comes down with her uh, one of her relatives and the nurse on the other side. And she was gaunt and pale and weak. And the dress hung off of her because she had lost so much of herself or weight uh, during the, the chemotherapy and the radiation. But she was beaming. She was a bride. And it was gorgeous. And they came down. She had to sit through the wedding because she couldn't stand up. She didn't have the strength. I did the prayers as fast as I possibly could. I taught everyone how to sing Simon Tov and Mazel Tov. Um, people of every faith and background. Um, we finish the wedding. He puts a ring on her finger. We read the ketubah. He smashes the glass. We all scream mazel tov. They give each other a big smoochy kiss. She goes back upstairs with the nurse. The rest of us stayed for a little while to have a, a toast. Um, she died 10 days later. And um, she died with the wedding picture next to her. She was clutching the wedding picture. This was the most important thing she wanted in the world before she left the world is to be a bride. And we gave her that. And it was just, 
So Chaye Sara, everything where, where death and love come together and how death heal, how death sours us on this world, but how love gives us the strength to move forward. That's what that story is about. Before we finish, I just want to make one short comment and announcement, if you'll permit me. Um, I, I sent a letter to the congregation of Ali Beth Shalom this week, and I want to make sure that everyone understands it. Um, I've determined that after 30 years at VBS and the last 16 years as the senior rabbi of the synagogue, it's time for me to pass the chair, pass the baton to somebody else. Um, so the synagogue has, I've informed the leadership of the synagogue that I would like to move from my position as senior rabbi to just be a plain old rabbi of the synagogue, which means I'll have more time for my family and more time for my teaching and writing and things, but I still want to be at VBS. So the synagogue has accepted that offer and has begun a search for a new senior rabbi. For the course of this year, I'm still here. Um, and looking forward to doing Torah study with my dear colleagues and friends and maybe even being back in person one day. But so far, this works just fine. And uh, for next year, I will be as well full time at the synagogue, helping a new person come into the position. And thereafter, I'll, re I'll, I'll be in a lesser position, but still be a rabbi of the synagogue and be available and, and, and present to teach and to help and to care and to celebrate. And that's my big change in life. And I appreciate everyone's love and support. I've gotten a lot of messages from friends who, uh, telling me how, how, um, how, how kind they've been and how, how supportive they are at this moment of our transition. But I'm still here and not going anywhere. And I do appreciate. So thank you to Rabbi Hirsch. Thank you to Rabbi Gelman. And thank you to everyone for listening. We wish you Shabbat Shalom. God bless you. Man.